So thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, Steve Kesters is one of our uh, medicine pediatric faculty who practices at our Grandview Yard Clinic. Uh, he's uh, joining us today to discuss attention deficit disorder. Uh, it's obviously a topic uh, you know that afflicts a number of uh, children and also adults. So we really appreciate Steve coming by today to, to give us a primer on this important condition. Thanks, Steve. Okay, well, as uh, Naran said, the APD is a pretty common thing that you're going to encounter, whether you're an internist or a pediatrician. Since I was dual trained, I got quite a bit of exposure to this for my uh, pediatric population, but very little, if any, exposure for my adult population. So what I want to talk about today is how APD presents both in children and adults, uh, some of the common comorbidities that run along with it, how to diagnose it, and then some of the treatment strategies, particularly with emphasis on medication management. A couple of case studies to get us started. 48-year-old male whose son was recently diagnosed with ADD. He noticed he has many of the same features, tried his son's medication, noticed it worked, wants a prescription for it. Number two, 38-year-old male with a history of chronic disorganization, underachievement, marital and job problems, thinks ADD may be a root cause and so wants to get evaluated for it. When you talk about ADD or ADHD, and I'll use those terms interchangeably, the H does stand for hyperactivity, but most people will kind of throw the terms back and forth. There really are three core symptoms that you're looking at, inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. That being said, it does spill over into other areas too, including executive function and emotions. So people can't have trouble with organizational things, higher level cognitive skills, emotional dysregulation, and so those are important considerations in terms of how it impacts people. In general, about 10% of children are diagnosed with ADD, and studies suggest that probably half of these are so uh, persistent to adulthood, but only about 2 or 4% of adults are actually diagnosed, and only about a quarter of those actually receive treatment. So it's, it's a common problem, but it's not always treated or even recognized. How does it impact people? Well, in kids, it's pretty obvious it impacts their schooling. Uh, there's a lot of cost associated with the schooling of those kids helping those kids do better, but it really impacts more than that. It impacts self-esteem, it impairs social skills, it affects your ability to make friends, it affects family relationships. There is a higher rate of divorce in families with an ADD kid. So obviously it impacts multiple dimensions. When you step into adulthood though, the costs are even more staggering. So occupational difficulties, people not performing as well at work, um, either bringing as much money home or being productive for their business. There's an increased risk of accidents, like car accidents or workplace injuries. There's a higher association with criminals in ADD. 25-40% of inmates test positive for ADD. And there is some association with substance abuse as well. Genetically speaking, there is definitely a correlation. Um, if you have a sibling with ADD, there's about a third uh, chance that you will have it as well. And a lot of parents who have ADD will have a kid who's diagnosed. That being said, I more often find the opposite situation where a child is diagnosed and a parent recognizes those symptoms because ADD was not commonly recognized 20 and 30 and 40 years ago. So going back to those core symptoms on the left, inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity, they can't present differently between kids and adults. With kids, you think of daydreaming, careless mistakes, losing things for inattention. For adults, it's more that difficulty organizing or poor time management. For impulsivity, is the kid who can't you know, keep quiet in class, who won't raise his hand before answering. But in adults, it's um, impulsive things like quitting a job or ending a relationship or driving violation. And then hyperactivity, you hear that classic phrase as if driven by a motor for kids. But for adults, it may just be restlessness or constant activity. So it can present in different forms, but the same basic symptoms are there. Um, in terms of how you diagnose ADD, a lot of times people start with screening forms. For kids, most people have heard of Connor scales or Vanderbilt forms. For adults, there's a couple of self-reporting scales and other scales that can kind of screen for it. And I'm going to show an example of one of these. These are a good place to start if you're concerned about it. Uh, this is one of the short forms, the adult self-report scale. And this one asks you a series of six questions, ranging from, you know, do you have trouble wrapping up details in a project, trouble remembering appointments, uh, overly active, or do you feel as if driven by a motor? And if you answer four or more of these in the darkly shaded box, you're considered at risk for ADD. The formal diagnosis, though, is based on DSM criteria. And there's DSM-4 and there's DSM-5. The newest one, uh, the big change is that DSM-5 changed the age of, age of presentation to having symptoms present by age 12, whereas DSM-4, I believe it was age 7. 
it also is important that symptoms are present in more than one setting. So not just at school, but school and home, or not just at work, for example. Um, and these symptoms must interfere with or reduce the quality of social, academic, or occupational function. And then finally, symptoms cannot be better explained by another mental disorder. The, these are the nine criteria that DSM-5 lists. I'm not going to read them all, but it, these are the ones that fall under inattention. For a child, they have to meet six of these. For an adult, five of these. And then for hyperactivity or impulsivity, these are nine more criteria. And again, six of these for kids, five of these for adults. And I, you, these will be in the slides for reference, and I created the smart phrase, and I guess that you can pull these up if you're interested in doing the formal checklist. In the end, if they meet the criteria, you can label this as predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive or impulsive, or a combined presentation. And that, um, it, to be honest, doesn't greatly influence your therapy, but it can at least uh, tell you what you're looking for in terms of treatment strategies or, or outcomes. Some special consideration, classically girls, especially in children, seem to have more of the inattentive symptoms. This is a stereotype, but it seems to hold true for a lot of uh, people. The age of presentation can vary as well. As you saw on the previous list, DSM criteria suggest that symptoms must be present by age 12. Um, I've seen this present at multiple ages. I think it varies a little bit with the situation and the stresses that a, a child or an adult faces. I actually had a, a medical resident present um, probably about five years ago was referred to me because he was found to be ADD on testing. And I think he was just a bright enough individual that until he reached that highest level of stress and demands, he was bright enough to overcome some of the challenges of organization and coping. Um, so I, I would say don't rule it out completely if they're older than age 12, and at the same time, if you go back in history, a lot of people who have symptoms present at a pretty early age. And finally, diagnosis can definitely be complicated or influenced by other conditions. Classically, in kids, we think of learning disabilities. In adults, we think more of the psychological conditions, but children can have those same conditions as well. So let me circle back to those case studies and talk about them. So the first gentleman was the guy who had tried his son's medication, found out that it worked for him, and wanted a, a prescription. But he had kind of an odd affect, and I, there was something about him that seemed quirky, so I sent him for some further testing. A neuropsychologist pulled out a lot of interesting things, such as interpreting communication in an overly literal manner, um, learning to function socially by sort of mimicking uh, function or interaction he'd seen that worked in the past. He actually scored very poorly for his ability to recognize and explain socially appropriate behavior. And in the end, the neuropsychologist thought he met criteria for an autism spectrum disorder. So that one kind of came out of the blue for me. I didn't, those were things in the history that unless I, somebody asked very specifically, would not have come out. The second gentleman was the gentleman who just was having trouble functioning at work, at home, with relationships, and he did have a lot of symptoms of ADD, impulsivity, poor judgment. But uh, a neuropsychologist also pulled out symptoms of egocentricity, lifelong irritability. Um, and after a couple hours of testing, diagnosed him with a borderline personality disorder and an unspecified mood disorder. Now, they didn't completely rule out ADD, but they said it was hard to make that diagnosis in the setting of the other one. Um, that being said, this is not to say that you should never diagnose people on your own. Um, I think it's very uh, reasonable to consider that. At the same time, if something doesn't strike you as right, I think it's important to consider those uh, comorbid conditions. Um, statistically, a lot of people, about a third of people, can have a mood disorder, depression or bipolar. Personality disorders are pretty common as well, ranging from antisocial in adults or just more of a conduct disorder in kids. Um, anxiety disorders, again, in 25 to 50 percent, and then there's an overlap of substance abuse as well. So the problem is many people have more than one diagnosis, and it's, it's, you know, it's important to consider all those things when you're making a diagnosis of ADD, and unfortunately, if they have ADD, they're more likely to have one of the others as well, so it goes both ways. And these might be reasons for a treatment failure or, or trouble with responding like they should to your intervention. Um, this is just an example of some of the testing those two patients from case studies went through when they went to a neuropsychologist. And that's not to say that you should do all these or be familiar with them or that every patient needs these. But when you're trying to figure out how people function and how they, you know, whether there's other conditions going on, these are just some of the tests that can be done to help uh, decipher that. Um, So when we talk about treatment, there are really two broad categories for ADD and ADHD. The first would fall under psychotherapy, and then the second would be medication-based. Psychotherapy is things like cognitive behavioral interventions, mindfulness, organizational strategies, and they have shown some promise with executive function and organization. So they may be worthwhile in some people. 
That being said, there really are no trials comparing directly medications versus psychotherapy intervention. And in general, medications are considered superior and they have a pretty good response rate. Within the medications, there's a stimulant class and then the non-stimulants. Uh, stimulants are further broken down into methylphenidates and amphetamine derivatives, and then the non-stimulants are some other ones like atomoxine, which is commonly known as Tritera, things like bupropion, guanfacine, clonidine, and a couple others. So we're going to get into those a little bit further. Um, treatment outcomes. Medications in particular can reduce some of those core symptoms by up to 75%, so they're pretty efficacious if you can find one that works for people. They can definitely decrease the burden of illness in children, and they've shown impacts on adults with lower incidence of accidents, and they may even reduce substance abuse, even though they're controlled substances and people worry about their diversion. There is some debate about the substance abuse part, and, and there's no clear uh, answer on that yet, though. Before you treat, though, one of the things you should consider is um, a basic medical assessment and then a cardiac assessment. So with medical assessment, you're looking for those comorbid conditions. Uh, you're looking for any other uh, symptoms that may either be worsened by medication treatment or may be impacted, things like appetite, sleep pattern, presence of headache, vital signs like blood pressure, heart rate, weight. And then you can consider a controlled substances contract if you have concerns about um, abuse potential or diversion. And then cardiac specifically, it is important to do a comprehensive cardiac personal and family history, looking for exam findings like a murmur or abnormal habitus. Um, that being said, there's no clear evidence that stimulants increase sudden cardiac death, uh, and EKG is not routinely warranted in everybody. Uh, and a lot of my adults who are old enough to, I guess, be at some risk, I often use it as a good excuse to obtain an ECG. Most kids I do not, unless they have an abnormal exam. At the same time, it, it's not absolutely required. When you talk about medications for ADD, generally stimulants are your first class that you're going to start with. And again, those are broken down into the methylphenidate derivatives and the dextroamphetamine derivatives. The second line is usually considered some of the antidepressant class, like Stratera and Wellbutrin. And then non-stimulants like clonidine and guanfacine are usually considered third line. How they work is not always clear. Stock feed my neurotransmitters like a lot of medications work. Uh, at the same time, there's continued uh, mystery on some of these and exactly why they work like they do. One of the things we always think about with medications is getting the person, you know, into that therapeutic window. So particularly with ADD, there's often a target time where you're trying to help them. School day, work day, sports event, time where they need to focus or study or, or concentrate on, on other things. And remember, all medications take a while to start. All medications take a while to leave the system. And then there are, you know, kind of a minimum effective concentration and a toxic concentration. So keep this in mind when we're dosing medications, and I think it'll help guide you on what medication may be most effective or, or how to tailor their treatment. And then finally, it's important to think about their performance. Um, I kind of liken stimulant use to a little bit of anxiety. Some anxiety will help you work better. It'll help you worry just enough to prepare a little bit more, to, you know, put a little more effort in. And too much anxiety will completely make you fall apart. Stimulants, I think, are a little bit the same way. Enough of a stimulant may help you focus. Too much is going to bring on side effects. So you really want to help them hit their peak performance. And the key point of that is more is not always better. So specifically with stimulants, dosing may be partly weight-based, but it's reasonable to start at a low dose and then gradually increase, uh, looking for that optimal function, looking for side effects that the patient cannot tolerate, or reaching the maximum dose. And in general, the hyperactivity and impulsivity seem to benefit a little bit more from the higher doses in inattention. So getting into the specific medications, um, I've got several charts here, and I've got a link to them in IHIS at the end. I pulled average costs just off a couple online sources, but they vary widely depending on where you look at them and where you get them. But I wanted to give you just kind of a breakdown of some of the short and long acting, which ones are generic and which ones aren't. Um, these are the short acting methylphenidate derivatives. Uh, Ritalin and then Focalin are probably the two you're going to hear about most. Ritalin is methylphenidate, Focalin is dexmethylphenidate. And what you'll see is they're relatively inexpensive, relatively short duration. And then there are some chewable and liquid suspensions for people who cannot tolerate uh, pills. Switching over to short-acting amphetamines, uh, most classic one you'll hear is Adderall. And what you'll see is it's pretty inexpensive as well. It's a mixed amphetamine salt. Its duration is slightly longer, but that's still considered shorter acting in the greater scheme of things. Um, as a side note, a lot of people seem to respond either to methylphenidate or the, the amphetamine salts the best, and it's not exactly clear why, but a lot of times if they fail one or have side effects to one, consider switching to the other class. A lot of times it seems to work for people. 
When you get into the long acting, I think is where it gets a lot more confusing. So these are the methylphenidate derivatives that are medium and long acting. And what you'll see is there's a whole bunch more of them. The durations vary quite a bit wider. Um, some are generic, some are not. How they're made up varies and the cost is much more um, escalated. Uh, what I want to point out here is that there are some good generic options. Um, Generally, duration is going to last closer to that 8 to 12 hour range, although some of the ones like Metadate ER list the duration of only 3 to 8 hours, which is kind of a short to medium acting. Uh, and that may explain why it works better for some people than others. Um, under the notes section, you'll see a couple of them are listed with the IR's immediate release and ER's extended release. And that gives you an idea of how they may break down in the system and how they may impact somebody or, or what kind of time coverage you may get and where they peak. So we're going to show a couple of graphs of these. I just want to give that as a reference. And then just to complete it, these are the amphetamine derivatives and some of the short long acting. Generally, Adderall, XR, and then Vyvanse are the two big ones you're going to hear about here. Um, Adderall, XR is a generic, Vyvanse is not. And that's probably the biggest difference in cost um, or in coverage insurance, not necessarily in overall cost. And uh, Vyvanse we'll talk about in a minute is a pro drug, which has some different characteristics. And then as a, these are some of the commonly used non-stimulants, Stratera being the most common one you hear about specifically for ADD, and some of the other ones you're more familiar with for other indications. Uh, one of the key points here is Stratera is not generic yet. It's often a, uh, requires prior authorization for a lot of insurance companies. It can be a good choice for people and has specific uses, but it's often not going to be your first line, partly because of efficaciousness and partly because of uh, cost or insurance coverage. So when I think of ADD medications, I think of them as similar to insulin dosing. Um, ADD medications, as you saw, come in all kinds of ranges when they hit their peak, how long they last. Um, you know, some have dual peaks from immediate and sustained relief. And I, I think as an internist, you probably all know that, you know, insulin is something that's pretty complicated, but we've become familiar with through use. And I think ADD medications are very similar. So just as you think of like an Aspart or Lispro insulin working very quick and short acting, that may be the equivalent of like a Ritalin or, or methylphenidate versus a, an extended release or an NPH may be more like one of the time release medications like an Adderall XR or something. Uh, so when you look at dosing curves, I think I can help you to keep in mind what period of time you're trying to cover or give somebody a response. Um, I couldn't find one graph to pull them all together, but what I did is pulled up some examples of, like this is Folkland, for example. And the white dots are the immediate release, giving uh, two 10 milligram doses four hours apart. The Focalent XR is a 20 milligram dose, essentially giving you that 50% immediate release, 50% extended or percent like second uh, extended release. Um, these are particularly useful for kids and even adults who don't want to have to deal with a dose in the middle of the day, kids who don't want to have to go to the nursing office uh, at noon to get another dose. But they're useful for adults too who are looking for that all day long coverage. And what you'll see is most of these are just meant to mimic multiple administrations of smaller doses or, or immediate release doses. Concert is a little bit different in that it's a special capsule, and it actually gives a, a about a quarter of it immediately as an immediate release, but the whole uh, capsule contains immediate release methylphenidate, and the rest is delivered, kind of a second and third dose is delivered by an expanding osmotic compartment. So this is one that gradually pushes out medication as it moves through the GI system. Uh, and so it's unique in how it works. One quirky thing is that that capsule will come through on the other end. People may notice it's in their school, and that can freak people out, but it is normal. Uh, it should be empty when it comes out if it released everything properly. Uh, here is, uh, this is Concerta, so this is how Concerta looks when you compare three small doses of methylphenidate to five milligrams versus the 18 milligram size Concerta. Again, it's a little bit more of a smooth curve, but it's supposed to have that sort of extended um, delivery over, you know, 12-ish hours or more. And this is a, an overlay of several, and again, it's a very busy graph, but what I mostly wanted to show you with this is that some will have different peaks than others. Uh, in this graph, it shows Concerta having a pretty slow onset. Other ones peak pretty quickly. Some have an excessively high peak. And these are all supposed to be relatively equivalent doses. So I think this can help explain why some people really get side effects on one and not another, and why switching uh, between medications may be reasonable sometimes, especially if people aren't responding well to one or have a particular side effect or time interval you're trying to cover. Uh, Adderall XR is essentially a special capsule with a mix of immediate release speeds and delayed release speeds. So again, you, uh, when you look at that in a graph form, uh, these are two different doses. So the lower doses is two immediate releases versus an extended release, and the upper curve is actually the same medication, just higher dosing. 
And that kind of goes back to that therapeutic window concept. So a small dose may not be enough, but look how long that high dose lasts. I mean, well into you know, 12, 16 hours, depending on where their threshold is for symptoms or being able to go to sleep at night. So these are important things to keep in mind when you're dosing medication. And then Vyvanse is special in that it's lis amphetamine. So again, it's an amphetamine derivative. It's a prodrug. It gets enzymatically cleaved into the active product. Uh, and so it's a little bit more of a fixed release over time. It's thought to be less usable. And when you look at that in terms of like kind of a dose curve, uh, the green shows two immediate release of uh, uh, an amphetamine product. And then Vyvanse is the purple curve, looking at a nice kind of smoother, longer curve. Uh, again, Vyvanse is still a, a brand name right now, which means it's a little more expensive for people, but for some people it does work better, a little bit more smoothly. And then last but not least, the Daytrona patch is one that deserves special mention because it takes a different form. So it's a topical form, it's a methylphenidate derivative, and it is one that um, you'll see kind of starts pretty slowly, so it can take a couple hours to really kick in, but then it progressively increases as day goes on. This has positives and negatives, it can last a long time. It really doesn't start declining until you remove the patch. In class, they tell you to remove the patch after nine hours where the arrow is on the bottom of the screen, but it can take another several hours to clear the system. So for some people, that can be very useful. For some people, it's not a good fit. It is also still a brand name, so a little bit more expensive. <clears throat> Why do we think about the brand name and generic? Well, we do get rated on these things. So shared saving is something that we're all encountering more and more often. These are some of the most recent rates for OSU. What you'll see is that we do pretty well with generic use, but not as good as some other uh, community comparisons. Now, compared to like a, you know, beta blockers or, or adult staff medications, there are fewer generics available. So it's not expected that we'd be in the 90% for these. At the same time, I wanted to highlight that there are good generic choices. And these are good ones to start with. They may not always work for people because of how they respond, but a good way to start is to consider some of the generics. So this is just a real quick summary table of the methylphenidate versus the amphetamine, the generics versus the brand names. Um, in a, a real quick summary form, again, all of these tables are in one big link on a, at the end I'll reference it, it's an IHIS link you're welcome to steal from me. And then quickly I want to just mention diversion. It's something that the state board focuses more on narcotics and benzodiazepines, but these are controlled substances that can be diverted and abused. Um, medications like Stratera and Vyvanse may be good choices for people who are a little bit higher risk of abuse. At the same time, it's something you at least want to think about. Um, but it's not necessarily mandated like it is for some of the opiates in terms of uh, tracking with or reports. Uh, so if someone's failing to respond, what do you think about? Well, review the dosing and compliance, make sure they're taking it right, making sure you have a good medication choice. Think at least about diversion. Uh, comorbid conditions, did you miss any? Do you need to reassess? And then one other thing I at least want to mention is genetic-based decision support. Um, GeneSight is the one we've used in our office. I have no affiliation with them, but it's one I found useful for a couple people, not necessarily everybody. It can give you some insight on metabolism, how they process through different medications. And it can at least suggest whether they are a little bit more prone to, you know, have interactions with certain medications or have trouble processing and need different dosing uh, range than other people may need. So I do not use this as a first line, but I have had some people who have really struggled to find the right medication, had a very clear diagnosis of ADD, um, and I found it helpful in certain situations. And that can also shed some light on antidepressants or psychotropic medications too. So when people have those comorbid conditions and you're looking to use several medications to get them under good control, I think it can be a valuable tool at times. So in the end, ADHD is very common in children and adults. It has big costs to the individual and society. It can be very rewarding to see people function better. I kind of liken it to my experience with learning to treat anxiety and depression in adults. Uh, I don't feel like I got tons of training or at least didn't develop a lot of comfort with that in residency. And at the same time as I've gotten out into practice, I found it a, actually a pretty rewarding thing to treat because a lot of people get better. They come back and they're different people. They thank you. They're really appreciative. And ADHD is much the same way. So for the people who haven't had a lot of experience with it, I'd encourage you to sort of develop that over time. I think you'll find it rewarding to treat people will be very happy with your health. And then the big thing is look out for comorbid conditions. A lot of times they uh, can present a little differently. A lot of people aren't presenting to adults right now just because it's becoming more common to, to, um, that they hear about it or, or recognize the symptoms of it. But you do need to consider comorbid conditions and consider rescreening if the initial treatment is not working like it should. And finally, know your options for generics. There's a lot of good things out there. And these are a couple of the links to resources, some of the IHIS links and a couple of websites that just have some good kind of tools and information for, for both providers and patients. So with that, I'd be happy to entertain any questions people have.
Well, thank you, Steve. That was really a great review. Uh, I'm going to start off with one uh, question, and then we'll open up to everybody else. So, Steve, so uh, real quickly, when you start somebody on treatment, what's your thoughts about how long to treat and how often? I mean, if you start somebody in their age 25 or 30 and they're getting benefit, how do you gauge the duration that that person would require the treatment? Um, you know, it's a good question. I don't know if there's a clear answer to that. I guess what I would say, it, I, I'd break that into two parts. In terms of how long it takes to see a response, most of the stimulants work pretty quickly. So I would hope people see a pretty immediate response. And I think it's worth giving them some time to adjust and kind of figure out the dosing. But I think hopefully you'll see some um, responses pretty quickly after making dose changes. In terms of actual duration to treat, I think it really depends on what you're treating and what situation they're in. If they're, you know, in a high stress position where they need to be at their peak of function all day long, and, and they maintain a position for a long time, they may benefit from it for years. I think other people, and I think a lot of adults who sort of adapt to ADD, learn to cope with their diagnosis in different ways. They learn to organize, they learn to keep lists, they learn to do things to keep themselves on the ball. And I think some people either don't find the benefit from medications great enough or find some side effects not um, that they don't like and therefore want to get off it when they can and will kind of self know over time. Okay, very good. So, uh, folks on the phone or in the conference room, uh, go ahead and open up any questions if you have. I do have a question, uh, sort of piggybacking on that one. It's not uncommon to have a patient come over from pediatric to the adult side, and they're 18, and let's say they've been on, you know, Adderall for, you know, since they were 11 or 12. And it's my understanding that in some cases, you know, these conditions kind of attenuate with time and that people, the natural history of it is that people may not need to be treated permanently for ADHD. But often patients are very attached to these medicines and they are afraid that if you take them away, they're going to be dysfunctional. So how do you address that situation? Uh, I think it's a great question. I, there are, there's some evidence that people may outgrow it to an extent, although I think years ago it was believed that everybody outgrew it and that's definitely not true. Um, I, I, I guess what I would say is, as a, as a provider, don't flat out refuse to prescribe just because they came with that diagnosis when transitioning um, from a pediatric practice. Because I don't think that's in their best interest, and I don't think that's good for you know good practice for you. At the same time, I think you can negotiate a trial off it, or depending on what they're facing, whether or not they really need the same dosing, or, or uh, assess what it's doing for them. Uh, I think there is sort of that psychological dependence. People feel like it's helping them, and it may be nice to do a trial off to prove whether it's actually helping them or not. Uh, because if they can get by without medications, I think it's a general medical principle. If you don't need the medication, don't use it. At the same time, if it's clearly offering benefit, it's probably worth continuing for many young adults into later adulthood. That's great. Thing. I have a question. One of the things I find tricky to answer is, like, basically, is a stimulant safe to use in an adult? Because there's not a lot of data for, like, certain past medical histories and things like that. Did you see anything about, like, here are patients where you wouldn't use a um, I think probably the biggest one that comes up that has to do with cardiac stuff. Yeah. I mean, and, and like I said, in the in all the evidence I could find or all the, the information I reviewed for this, there's been no solid evidence that people with a kind of average risk or, or no known risk of extra heart disease um, should be should be likely to have problems. At the same time, we know people sometimes respond to caffeine differently. So I mm -hmm. think there are people who don't like how it makes them feel. Uh, but the absolute medical risk from the cardiac standpoint is not thought to be great unless they have an obvious abnormality on an exam or known family history of something unusual, in which case it may be reasonable to get a more formal cardiac clearance. Uh, and then, as always, you want to look at medication interactions particularly. Most adults, you know, most kids we treat are not on any other medications. I think a lot of adults have multiple other medications and often more comorbid conditions. So I think if you do your homework with that, uh, I don't believe I've encountered any other absolute contraindications to treatment. Kelly, can you make sure you can you make sure you unmute the phones for the folks that are calling in? How do we do that? Anybody know how to do that? If you go to the top, you'll see participants, and then float over the participant list and right click, and you'll see a button that says unmute. If you I think if you right click, you've already done this. Yeah, you're kidding. You've done this. They're all muted. And then right click and hit unmute all. Oh. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. 
Another so with question. that, we can, we can open up to other questions. Go ahead. Another question, if, if there's nobody on the phone waiting to ask. Um, the other thing that I guess concerns me a little in prescribing for patients is, you know, although it's not a drug of abuse perhaps in the way that opioids are, these stimulants are definitely perceived as performance enhancers, especially by college students and, you know, graduate students and, you know, and medical students in heaven, heaven help us. Um, you know, and so I, I guess I'm a little wary when you, know, you have somebody who's knowledgeable enough to give you a history that's suggestive of ADD, whether it's something they had from childhood or whether it's something they've, they're just coming in with new. How do you kind of sort out those who may be trying to get the medicines for the wrong reason? So I, I think it's a great follow-up, and, and what I'd say is a couple things. Most people who are transferring into your practice, especially if they just, you know, turned 18 or left pediatric practice, um, in theory, if they're coming in on medication, they should have been diagnosed somewhere when younger. So it doesn't mean that someone who's diagnosed at 12 can't be abusing a medication, but at least they have that history there. Yeah. And I will send for old medical records and get whatever diagnosis they have. In fact, more insurance companies are requiring some kind of documentation of it now. Um, so I think that's step one. Uh, number two, there's nothing that says you can't make them go back through testing. If you're uncomfortable with how they present or if you feel like they may have other stuff going on, um, I think you can send it back for a reevaluation, and that can be done by somebody independently, uh, you know, a psychologist or neuropsychologist, uh, if you're not comfortable with how they present or don't feel comfortable enough to do that. And then um, number three, I think, you know, that's where the controlled substance agreements can also come in. Um, if you worry that they're uh, diverting or abusing, um, I think it's fair to hold them to the same standards we hold our, our narcotic patients too from the standpoint of if they're, you know, using marijuana or other uh, medic or other, you know, illicit drugs or if they are taking it but it's not in their system when they come in to see you, I, I think you can at least legitimately question that as well. So I'm not saying you should, you know, carte blanche prescribe to anybody who comes in and wants it, but a lot of people come in with a diagnosis that was made many years ago. It, it seems to fit. Uh, they benefit from it, and at least, you know, I, there's always patients who are going to deceive us, but I think that's where you go with your gut feeling on whether they're trustworthy or not. And if you do retest them, do you have to retest them off the medicine, or can they be legitimately tested while still taking it? Um, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I, um, I, I think you get in that debate in kids, too, with when you're testing for, like, learning disabilities, but you think they have ADD, do you treat with it the ADD so that it's harmed better or not? And, and I think you get a healthy debate on both sides. I guess what I would say is if I was referring to somebody, I'd probably let them decide whether they prefer to test on or off. Yeah. But I don't know if I can answer that for everybody. Um, the gene site technology you mentioned, can you order that now or do they still refer, require a psychiatrist order? Um, we, we don't do it like all the time. We do it through our office and we had a, a nurse who was trained in it and essentially it's a cheek swab. It is about as easy as you can get. Uh, it does have a cost to it. Uh, it's, I think it can cost several hundred dollars depending on how much insurance chips in. But, uh, you know, in examples, I had an autistic kid who we tried one medication. He had a horrible response to it and told me he wouldn't try anything else ever again. I said, how about you give me one more shot? We swabbed them. We saw the most likely one to help. We did it. And we actually had some good success. So I, I'm not saying that it's going to work in everybody, and I wouldn't do it in everybody, but I think it can be valuable in certain situations. All right. Do we have any other last questions before we wrap things up today? Okay. Well, I want to formally thank Steve for joining us today. I think the talk was just really excellent. We obviously have a lot of patients that present with symptoms uh, uh, concerning for ADHD, and I think we're all probably better equipped at this point to handle those. Uh, we will post the video uh, probably in about a week. We'll also post the PowerPoint slides, and, and maybe, Steve, we can talk offline. And if there's one summary slide that we could use as a handout, maybe with the list of medications, that might be a useful resource for everybody. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody.